Uh, welcome to Unit 3. I just blanked again. I should make myself notes. Unit 3, this is Part 2 of End of Life. We're going to really briefly compare and contrast palliative and hospice care. So, you know, why, why, right? I know that's a question that I kind of rhetorically ask for you. But I do think it's important. I think it's always um, valuable and worthwhile to ask, why am I doing this? Why is this important? How will this impact what I do? Um, and the answer here for you is that if you are working in elder care, in geriatric care, in any format, you will be working with end-of-life teams. Um, it's honestly, it's inevitable. As I said earlier, you will be working, you will be seeing patients die. Um, that's true in any field, but it's especially true in elder care. So I think it's worth looking at what does that mean? How does that impact what you do? How does that change your job expectations? So let's discuss uh, hospice and palliative care. It's also worth noting very quickly, a reminder here, that if you have worked in other settings, you are definitely familiar with hospice to some degree. Um, there are always patients in which it's decided that the best course at this point is to control symptoms and allow nature to take its course. Um, what's really different here in uh, lots of elder care patients and lots of elder care settings at least is the timeline's different. For uh, acute care, hospice is a matter of often days, maybe hours. Uh, I remember as an intern a couple of times when I was preparing to go visit a patient in like critical care that uh, my preceptor would come by and say, don't, never mind, don't worry about it. They're, they're going into hospice. So in this case, yeah, there is no never mind, don't worry about it. Hospice can go months, e even years sometimes. Uh, not very often anymore. I'll be honest, that timeline has changed, but we're often talking months. So what does that mean for you? Right. Okay. So that that's my prelude. That's my argument for why this is important. So how are hospice and palliative care the same? Um, both of them primarily focus on pain management and symptom relief. And uh, both of them are multidisciplinary and team focused. There is no hospice dude that comes and that they call in and like turn on the hospice sign and, and he swoops in. It's a team. It's it is a team of people in a facility, uh, in a, like a long term care elder care facility, and we will talk about those later. Um, that's typically a team, a multidisciplinary team that is the team brought in for the residents or patients of that facility. That's not 100% true, but it's often true. So when? Uh, palliative care can be done at any time. It can be done at any stage of illness. Because remember, palliative care is pain management more than anything else. And remember also last uh, lecture we talked about how really palliative care is a pretty broad umbrella term. I uh, remember taking an aspirin is a palliative care measure. It, if you're doing it for a headache and not for, you know, heart health. Um, again, kissing your kid's boo-boo when they fall down. That's a palliative care measure. Anything that makes someone feel better is palliative. So there's no expectation at any point in treatment that you're just going to have to tough it out. There's always something that can be done to help alleviate symptoms. Hospice, remember, um, hospice, you need a patient with a terminal condition. Remember from last time that a terminal condition is a condition in which the disease, if it's allowed to run its natural course, is likely to cause death in six months or less. And that has to be certified, signed off on by a doctor. Again, nobody actually knows, right? So hospice goes as long as it needs to go. And it just is reassessed every six months. But it does have to have a patient with a terminal condition in order to trigger hospice. So where is it done? Similarly to the palliative care timeline, 
Uh, palliative care can be done anywhere. It doesn't have to be in any specific given spot. There, uh, at home, you can do palliative care. In a facility, you do palliative care. Anywhere. Um, and when we talk long-term care, palliative care tracks, we often mean in a facility with the in-house care team, typically. That's usually what happens when somebody is in a long-term care facility on a palliative care track. It doesn't have to be, but typically that's what it is. Hospice is usually done from home, and it's important to note that home means, uh, home is what it means to the patient involved, whether that is their home, a relative's home, uh, the facility, if you're working again in geriatric care and you're working in long-term care facilities, home is often the facility. They may have been there for months, maybe years at this point. So home is very often that facility. So it may be that they go someplace, get a hospice diagnosis and come back to the facility for hospice care. So in palliative care, the scope is predominantly the patient. And I know that sounds very, uh, there's more to it than that. Give me a minute. Um, the approach is to control uh, symptoms and discomfort, and it's to allow the patient to live the best life possible. Remember, again, that there is, let me go ahead, boom, to the next one. There is no expectation that the patient is going to necessarily stop treatment or uh, interventions for treatment for the condition. It's just that the focus is on comfort. Again, it doesn't even have to be, um, as I guess you'd expect, but I doesn't say it doesn't even have to be, but right, uh, you have palliative care for, like, say, a broken bone. It can be at any stage of an illness. It can be for any reason. Again, the whole point of having someone on a palliative care track is we are going to prioritize comfort over everything else. So again, there's no expectation that any kind of therapy or intervention or treatment is going to be avoided in palliative care. So what's the uh, RD's role in all this? Uh, it's mostly to provide MNT. Your role does not change that much if someone's on a palliative care track. You want, your goal is to maintain their current level of nutrition, health, and functionality. You know, if they are eating fairly well, continue eating fairly well. Um, if there are improvements to be made, we are going to do our best to intervene and do interventions for those issues. If someone has, say, a micronutrient deficiency, if they are at an unhealthy weight, because it can easily be argued that that person is not living their best life if they are fatigued, weak, at risk of micronutrient deficiencies. So we want to maintain or improve the uh, level of nutrition, function, health, and functionality. The second objective is to help the resident feel comfortable. And so here's where we get a little loosey-goosey. We get into areas that some people find a bit uncomfortable as practitioners. If they want to strictly control their diabetes, if they have been doing that for, you know, 30 years, uh, and honestly, 30 years is kind of a conservative timeline to give, but we'll go with that. Help them. Help them do it. Uh, continue doing carbohydrate counting, allow them to do finger stick checks or have somebody do that for them, let them do it. Um, if they don't care, don't push the issue. And you'll find this much more often in geriatric care is somebody who has done it for a long time and they, they just kind of don't care anymore. And if that's the case, you know, your place in this point is not to push it. This is not like an outpatient clinic and where, where you're trying to coach this person into better lifestyle choices, our job is comfort at this point. So if they don't want to do it, it might be worth it to suggest it, but don't push it. Okay. So hospice. Remember I said the scope in the last one is patient. The scope in hospice is the patient and their family, and really I should have said it's more like their immediate circle. Family, friends, uh, people who will be impacted by the patient's death are also involved in hospice care. The primary focus is again management and symptom control, but it's also educating the patient and family on what to expect. Um, if you have not seen somebody die, it's, it's an uncomfortable experience. It makes you feel very, very helpless, very, very frustrated, and I'm, I'm I'm speaking on both hands here, both, both as a family member and as a practitioner. 
And so a large part of this is educating the family on what to expect and educating the patient on what to expect. It also involves um, legal um, legal counsel, I guess. Not necessarily lawyers, but some help with legal things. Many people who are looking at end of life are concerned about what happens to my stuff. Are my kids going to be okay? How am I going to make sure that, um, you know, what happens after I'm gone? Will my religious, you know, will my spiritual needs be taken care of? Um, will my spouse be okay? So there's a lot of involvement of not just uh, the care team, the immediate care team of nurses, doctors, you. There's also the social worker, maybe a psychologist, a spiritual uh, guide or guided blah, spiritual counseling of some sort. There we go. All of that's taken care of as well. It's all part of hospice care. Well, the focus in, ho in hospice care, the philosophy of it is to concentrate on, cuff, on comfort. There is no disease ab abatement. If, for example, if you have somebody that can't swallow, on palliative care, you very well might start, and, and I mean this is hardcore, they can't swallow, uh, you might very well start enteral nutrition on a palliative care patient. You might not. It, it depends a bit. But you could. Because you could argue that's not leaving their best life at that point. In hospice, the intervention if somebody can't swallow is stop suggesting they try to eat. I'm going to give that a second to sink in because that feels very, very weird, and I, and I know it does. But it's simply, if they can't eat, we're not going to ask them to. If they don't want to do therapy, we're not going to ask them to. And I don't mean like, hardcore physical therapy here, but I mean, there, there is some like uh, restorative, we'll go into that a little bit later as well, uh, which is just trying to maintain functionality, but if they don't want to, fine. If they don't want to take their medication, we're not going to make them. It's much more about letting them decide what they want to do and making them as comfortable as possible. Their focus is to getting uh, the most out of the time they have, and by that I mean making sure that family is there, that caregivers are available, and that they're interacting with this person because it's very, very easy for a patient to become socially isolated in hospice care. Uh, all labs and therapy are stopped and sit down again. It might be their own restorative still, and we'll discuss that, but no kind of therapy with a therapeutic goal. Um, and again, treatments for an acute condition are fine, right? If they get an infection, while they're on hospice, we're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, it's just course of nature, sorry. No, no, well, they'll get, they'll get antibiotics. Uh, if they broke a bone, the, that will be treated. Uh, it's not like they just, you know, they're not just thrown to the wolves. Uh, therapies may be continued on long-term care. Uh, for example, uh, nebulizer treatments for um, COPD, uh, a diuretic for edema, but these things are for comfort, not for their therapeutic value. It's uncomfortable to not be able to breathe, so we're going to provide a nebulizing treatment for their COPD. You know, it's uncomfortable to have that extra weight on you from fluids, so we're going to remove that if they want us to. Uh, but again, all of this is focused on the patient's comfort. So what's your role in this? Um, and we will go into more of this as we go forward. Uh, your role is to help make their last days as comfortable as possible. And again, technically, this is everyone's role. Um, the reason I bring this up is I find that the dietitian is very, very involved in end of life. Um, I'm not 100% sure why that is the case, but it is very often, in my experience, the dietitian or the social worker in a patient with long, long-term care, at least, who's going to broach the idea first that maybe hospice care is appropriate. That's not a, that's not a given, but it does seem to be the case to me. Um, there are no dietary restrictions at all. Uh, you know, if if they are gluten intolerant, and no, let them have bread. If they're whatever, if they're diabetic and they want chocolate ice cream three times a day, sure. Um, now this is with the caveat that you might want to remind them that 
sometimes if you are, say, a gluten intolerant person, uh, you, you might not like the outcome of eating that bread. Just, you know, throw that out there, remind them. But if that's what they want, that's what they get. And uh, talk to them. Involve the patient in their care. Again, it's very easy for hospice patients to become isolated and you want to involve them. It's like, what what is important to you? What do you value? What would you like to have? What would you like to do? That's the most important part of this. Um, excuse me. Now, we can control for symptoms, you know, uh, nausea and vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, cramps, xerostomia. Um, as I said earlier, you know, if they are gluten tolerant and they say they want a plate of spaghetti, uh, remind them that maybe they don't because of their symptoms, that you might not want to do that. That's up to them. Um, your job is to inform and educate. Your job is not to um, suggest policy to them, if you will. Uh, so if we're having, if, um, let me, let me, let me, sorry, change tack here. So that's part of it. Another part of it is many times these kinds of symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, constipation, or diarrhea, are, in, they go along with end of life. So if that is the case, then we want to try to control as best we can, whether that is, you know, medication, um, some people swear by ginger, I don't know, man, uh, saltine crackers and Sprite, whatever they want, whatever makes them feel better, that's what we're here to do. Um, there are expectations involved in this. Right? Nobody is expecting a... Let me back up again here. I'm sorry. There, there are expectations involved in that you know, patient will have a drop-off in PO. As end-of-life approaches, there is a distinct drop-off in food intake. They will eventually begin to lose weight. Nobody is not expecting that to happen. There is a question of making sure that they have at least had the opportunity to do some interventions. So you want to provide a nutritional supplementation, maybe Remeron. You want to give them the opportunity to counteract that. But again, they may not care. And if they don't care, that's fine. All you need to do, practitioner like tidbit here, all you need to do is document that you provided the counseling, you gave them the options, this was their choice to make, this is what they decided to do, and that's okay. This is all ultimately centered around what the patient wants. So, uh, what else can you do? Uh, be their friend. And I know that sounds super, super hokey, but again, one more time, uh, hospice patients are often very, very socially isolated. It makes people uncomfortable to see, to be talking to someone that we know is a dead man walking. They, we just don't know how to deal with that well. And to, especially toward the end of life, I find that I'm much more involved in what they do. I mean, just as a general practice. So general, usually by the time we get to this point, I have spent some decent time with them. So I know them fairly well. Uh, so, and I probably know their family. So try to be there for them. Be available as much as you can just to be comforting. Um, you know, they're scared. They're lonely. Think about what it feels like to know that the end is approaching quickly. How would that feel to you? Uh, you want someone to talk to. You want somebody to hash out feelings with. So if, if you're the person, and you might be, if you're the person that they choose, try your best to be there. Uh, because you will often have developed a unique relationship with this person at this point. Um, I feel like this is a bit of a downer, and uh, the next one's going to be more of a downer. Uh, sorry about that. But that is hospice and palliative care. We're going to do end of life next time. Y'all have a good day, and I will catch you next time. Bye.